I, uh, I got your book, thank you. I find it really difficult to, uh, to, to go into it. Revisiting your, my, you know, my experience with you um, and what you went through, I find really um, upsetting. And I think that that's uh, an indicator of how shocking mental health issues are to people, not only the person that's suffering from it, like you did, but also to those that are close, which is really why I guess that's an amazing book. It's psychosis in particular, they being shocking. But if you see somebody who's extremely depressed and you, you wonder why they can't snap out of it, that's shocking as well, in its own way. Were, were both of your breakdowns diagnosed as acute psychotic episodes? That's what they are, yeah. It really in 99 that it was confirmed as bipolar. Because they had the first acute psychotic episode was in 97. Mm. Um, and that's where I had a number of different sick notes, as they were called at the time. Um, one was just like stress-related illness, which is harm, harmless enough. But another said acute psychotic episode. And that's mm. what I didn't understand at the time. And very few people around me understood it, um, what it what it kind of meant and what the implications were. But then because I had a relapse within two years, um, and the psychiatrist said the air is bipolar, that's when things started to um, race for me. I started to get lots of um, ideas, synchronicity type the coincidences. And I was actually having one of the best times of my life. Um, was really um, fantastic. Um, but um, work began realising some things were wrong because I'd disappear without telling them where I was going during the day. And um, I'd wander off to Westminster Abbey for a short while and just, just wander around there. Um, and then um, yes, they realised something was up and they took me to the hotel nearby in a sort of quiet space to talk to my boss and my boss's boss. And they said, we think you all go and see a doctor. Um, which I did the next day, and then that's where I kind of broke down in this in the surgery. What seemed like a five minute event was actually a doctor was rushing around for about an hour trying to find a space for me to go and to try, try and find a hospital for me. So, um, which I went into that night, amazingly enough, spent a month there. When you were um, in your in that high period, do you think? you were behaving differently so would other people have perceived you as being a bit there's something wrong with him but i don't know what it is yeah it was it was gradual because it was kind of a gradual build-up really um my world became more and more peculiar i um you know i was thinking that uh, the mi6 were after me that there were spies mm -hmm. spies everywhere um but i also thought i also felt invincible in that any ideas i had would could uh, you know, and they were grandiose ideas, could just be, would be wonderful, and, uh, you know, everything would be marvellous. Um, but my internal world became more and more dis dislocated from the normal world, as it were. Um, and, but as a, it did take people a while, and people at work, it took them a while to really, you know, it, it was probably a good six-week period um, where I started going particularly haywire, and... Uh, they didn't really pick up on it for, for some time, or as you say, they thought there was something wrong, but they weren't able to put their finger on it. Um, and I couldn't help because it was, um, I was very protective of my world because um, I thought it was real. Yeah. 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 So as I, I remember, I think, remember something Dad said as well at one point, is that you create your own internal logic about the world. So everything seems rational to you. Um, even though it's from the outside, it's completely irrational. You're thinking along different lines. Um, so just just to recap, then you you felt that your psychosis, the the acute psychotic episode that you had, the first one, was um, brought on by the, an accumulation of stress in your life circumstance, not just from workplace, was it? But then it, it was kind of the catalyst for the actual tipping over the edge was the event in the cafe, was it? Well, that's, that's how I felt. Um, but some people describe it, yeah, as uh, yeah, you say, a catalyst or trigger event. Um, but it was, yeah, it was stress that had built up over many years, really, where I hadn't resolved things. I hadn't um, worked to resolve things. And, and, and uh, there were issues in the relationship that I had at the time. 
and uh, I just tried to put everything to the back of my mind, which is probably the wrong place for it, and uh, um, wasn't able to rationalise it. So the car crash happened, in, I think it was the 14th of January 1997, when mm. I was um, in the cafe and uh, discovered something crunchy in my mouth that was the cockroach. That cockroach incident made me feel very angry uh, with the owner of the cafe and very angry about lots of things, angry that I couldn't solve or prevent something like that happening. Um, but uh, it could have been any a number of any other things that could have tipped me over. And we went abroad after that. We went to the States. There is some thought to be some effect i think it's on dopamine when you're actually traveling um you know across doing across date lines um that can have an effect on the mind as well so that, that might have took because this happened again in 99 when it was also another trip to the states just beforehand then do you think that the these the um the mental wellness issue that you encountered was something that was genetic. Do you think it was in the family? Because I remember that dad had that peculiar occasion where he uh, fell out of a tree. Do you remember that? Yes. Yeah, I remember going to see him in hospital. Yeah, after he broke a couple of ribs, didn't he? I don't think I actually went to the hospital to see him. I might have been too young. But mm -hmm. do you know? So was that? Do you know anything about that? Did dad talk to you about that afterwards? No, not no, not really. No, but he had. Um, I think I remember if Mum had said that um, they, he'd been stressed, you know, some some phrase like that. Um, but uh, yeah, he never said particularly why. He just no. Um, and I have heard that bipolar can often jump a, a generation because um, Dad's dad was diagnosed with neurasthenia, wasn't he? I don't know. No. Dad's dad was. He had neurasthenia. And he used to be, his behavior was very erratic at times. Very, one minute it'd be quite high and the next minute it'd be quite depressed. In fact, you know, I mentioned about a letter from Jenny. Yeah. That fell out when I got the book out. And in that she'd said that Kif, Kif was, um, had gone, we would always realize that, that whilst really appreciating his highs and how funny he was, they knew that the next day or two, he would really plummet into a, a deep, a quite a dark, depressive state. Right. So, right. And that's, which is typical of, of um, manic depression, bipolar. Bipolar, right. And is that what you basically are, are you have been diagnosed as, as having that, as living with that? Yes, that's right, yeah, bipolar, yeah. So, um, but I mean, there's also, um, uh, I remember talking to a conference quite a few years ago, about um, 150 people or something, and uh, I asked them, um, and they're all in the Manic Depressive uh, Bipolar Organisation, and I asked them whether they ever had any um, schizophrenic symptoms associated with it, and about a third of them put their hand up and said they had. Um, so, um, so as part of the psychosis, you can get other, some other, other symptoms. Um, well, schizophrenia is another psychotic illness, um, but you know you can get hallucinations in bipolar the same as you get them in schizophrenia. Right, because schizophrenia is the layman considers that I guess having seen too many Hollywood movies as you know the the axe wielding maniac, uh, which is a, just a different personality, isn't it? So it's a multiple personality disorder, which is it's is not correct. a personality disorder. Um, it is one of the psychoses, um, and and uh, yeah, that is a, a way the media portrays that as being violent, and that's not the case. People with um, psychotic illness are more harm to themselves than they are to anybody else. Right, right. And did you experience that? Well, harming myself? Yeah. No, I didn't. I didn't. Experience. But I was sectioned when I was in hospital. They th and that was supposedly for my own protection. I couldn't understand why at the time. <laughs> so, <laughs> that was uh, that's another story, though. Yeah, and it's quite a quite a vivid one as well. I mean, it's definitely worth a read of the book. Um, I mean, in terms of uh, you now, do you consider your your sort of mental health on a 
you know, a, a, a day to day basis, as it were. I know it sounds a bit crass, but you know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, well, the thing is, I've, I've accepted um, uh, medication or tablets ever since they were first given to me because they were a bit of a lifeline, really. They kept me out of um, going to a dark place I didn't want to go to. Um, so I've, I've stuck with those. Um, I have also, and as a way of managing the mental health, um, and I have also, you know, as you know, I take, I do cycling for fitness, which is supposed to help as well, and uh, do Tai Chi, um, which helps to relax and sort of meditation. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm kind of aware of it every day, and I often, I quite constantly wonder, well, what would it be like if I just stopped them all together? And uh, but I got a good idea of what it would be like. <laughs> So, yeah. Yeah. So, so I'm aware of it, but you know, I'm, I'd like to say I'm not defined by it. You know, I'm, I, if I describe what I'm defined by it, it would be by by writing, by my poetry and and other writing. You, you, we we said I said earlier on that you're incredibly creative, and I, I think do you think that goes hand in hand with this sort of mental health condition? Well, it can be. Can be. It's often said. I think with bipolar, that's the case. Um, some people are able to. Um, manage their or, or work through ride through their their episodes without having to have medication for example and and some can get some of their best ideas when they're in a manic type state or at least think they can um it's it's it you know, it's an individual thing is there's, there's no one you know everybody's an individual and everybody's unique so there's no one solution uh, and equally that would be said for like a psychiatrist prescribing you something, they don't know what's going to work for you any more than you do. From my point of view and the, and the work that I do now and the experience that I've had of life, um, one of the things that I'm constantly on the lookout when I meet new people, if they're either looking to do some mentoring work with me or whether they're working, if I'm working with them as a client, is whether they actually are... Um, uh, reflecting any tendency to psychosis or or the, the traits that i saw in you when you were going through your your yeah. periods of trouble so those times of being detached from what we would ordinarily call normality from reality uh, but for me it, it 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 causes um conflict within me because i know that in terms of um spiritual energy and some of the experiences that one can have in terms of spirit activity, then it, it the the the, bound, the you know the labels and the experience merge quite quite deeply. Um, and as I suppose, as you say, some people could be defined as skirting around a psychotic episode um, or experiencing a bipolar um, uh, high, um, and actually you know get through it reasonably well without any need for the medication etc one of the things that i do is um uh try to get people like that when they're when they're really buzzing and really do appear to be detached from what i would consider reality to try to get them to be as grounded as possible yes and i guess that's what you're saying the cycling does isn't it is that gets you grounded and back in your body is that really yes what? yeah that's right yeah and the tai chi does as well because um, funnily enough, because I don't know always. I mean, the worst times I was doing Tai Chi when I was pretty far gone. Um, but it does help to um, uh, relax and reflect. Right. Um, yeah. In, so in, in some respects, this, this uh, what I would call subtle energy, um, when you're doing Tai Chi, when you were doing it early in your... In, in one of your breakdowns, you were finding that actually that was pushing you more and more away from reality, wasn't it? So you were actually getting more enveloped by what I would call subtle energy, by the, the spirit energy that, uh, I'll use the word delusional, because we put delusional in terms of normality. Uh, and I'm not saying one is better than the other. I'm just saying that they're different in terms of mainstream definitions. So you would be spending more time in that kind of invented reality that you had. Uh, partly through yeah, doing I, much energy work. Yeah, I think you're right. I was responding to that energy um, because I didn't start the Tai Chi till after my first breakdown. 
and it was then in 99 when my second that I started using the moves to um which I thought were helping me identify um spiritual uh energies yeah I suppose so yeah I mean I would I would do like um I do like a recce around the room at the hospital and it was a tai chi type recce and um trying to sense what was there or imagining what was there or wasn't there um and i was using the tai chi form to do that um so yeah you yeah and I, you say yeah i'm sure I would, well i don't know what i was influenced by but yeah it was certainly, i certainly it was at the time believed that there were other forces of bell yeah I, I i think what's interesting from my point of view and it always has been is the similarities between what you were going through in in the nightmare scenario and in 1998 when you know nikki and i moved house and and we encountered the the what we perceived to be the spirit of the deceased lady in our house yeah you know i started to have anxiety attacks at that time and so you were going through this kind of massive psychotic episode or two which was really nightmare and then i was i was like i don't know whether i'm losing my mind or not here because you know that was my rational thinking of i really think i might be losing touch with stuff because i yeah. think it was you know delusional um and just the anxiety attacks were such that there was real fear and real um uh real kind of uh, mental um uh influences that just didn't make sense in a, yeah. normal, a normal reality, a normal person's reality. So I think I've always felt that your experience, I actually, what I actually believe, and I think, I mean, you've probably seen this in, in the introduction to my book, um, where I put that I think that you actually, <clears throat> you, you've gone through this partly so that I could see, that, you know, when, it, when this was happening to me, I, could, I, I used your experience as a, as a benchmark. Um, right. yeah. So, so because I I was constantly um, comparing what I was experiencing uh, in that house with with Jane to yeah. how did I perceive you to be experiencing the world? Was I experiencing the same as you? And I inevitably came to the conclusion most of the time, not all the time, most of the time, no, I I think it's different. So therefore, I think it's I think I'm okay. Okay. So not a benchmark to aim for then. <laughs> I wasn't working towards it. <laughs> I was trying to steer away from it. <laughs> yeah. But for which, actually, I'm, I'm eternally grateful. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry that you had to go through it, but thank I you. Like for like help. Help. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, I, I, you know, we don't know. I think that I think what was really interesting is earlier on you said that you know we um, we each form uh, uh, um, stories for our own realities. We each form um the justification for the way we behave and the way that things may occur in our reality and if we're taking the standard benchmark of normality and and delusional or psychotic behavior then those stories that we tell ourselves and explain things will always be there uh whether we're with delusional from somebody else's point of view or not you see, I, I come across a lot of people that, sorry, I'm, I know I'm doing a lot of talking, but it's, right. it, I think it's relevant. Um, I come across a lot of people that have very set beliefs and are experiencing things in their houses, which normal people would say, no, that's, that's nonsense, that's not possible. Now that can vary from somebody being affected by, um, or believing that they're being affected by uh, electromagnetic fields from their cell phones or whatever um to to ghost uh, activity let's say um and each of these you know what's very clear is that each person that i'm working with as a client has a very set world in yeah. which things happen so they have defined the parameters of their experience of reality and your your experience of reality is um is unique to you as, as you said before because we are each an individual human being and so when you were experiencing your psychotic episodes your your in a way what what i guess could be described as what you were experiencing was that your rules your belief system had just gone well hey you, you, the, the, it had completely changed hadn't it the structure mm. of your belief system had completely changed and therefore you were experiencing 
a whole new reality. It was, yeah. It was a whole, a whole different world, yeah, yeah. Very much so, yeah. You're not behaving in the way that everybody else is. So what I was saying about mania, you can be, become very productive in the manic phase. Um, it's just what happens afterwards when you, when you drop. And so what, does that, what is that like then? Because I think, I think it's easy for people to get their heads around the, 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 the manic phase where you're on this euphoric high. And then, sud- what, is it sudden for, for you? Is it like sudden? It depends. It can be. I mean, that example, when I was told to go to the doctors, then it was sudden. It's just that I, I didn't, I lost, I lost my internal compass, if you like. So I was just, uh, um, uh, you know, just there sort of in surgery at the time and not knowing what I should do or which way I should go. I wasn't really able to think for myself at that point. Um, and that was quite extreme. That only really happened like that. That first time was the worst, I guess, from the from the being down. So, do you think the men- mental health issues? I keep saying it, men- and mental health issues. I, I I always spin it when I say it. I always <laughs> that as a negative. I, when I've done workshops, I've asked people what do they think, what do they understand by the term mental health, and quite often people come up with Victorian asylums, as and they automatically they switch to the negative, whereas it's really the same as physical health you know everybody's got mental health and just the same you just have different degrees of it and different states of it um so it's all on a continuum or it's really like a circle really because you can have really good mental health then you could go into like a manic phase and then you go back around again to being um depressed or something so but you know, i like to think of it as a continuum from one state of health to another mm-hmm.